Hi, all, and warmly welcome to this webinar on water-wise climate mitigation in freshwater ecosystems. Uh, my name is Malin Wennerholm, and I am program officer at CV Swedish Waterhouse. And I'm together with my colleague Malin Lundberg Ingemarsson, who is the chief editor of the report on water and climate mitigation, organizing this webinar series. And uh, we are curious about who you are, who's joining us today. So if you want to please share your um, name and affiliation in the chat. Next slide, please. So in this webinar series, we will deep dive into five of the chapters in the report. And this is the third session where we will focus on chapter five of the report on climate mitigation in freshwater systems. Next slide. And here is the agenda of this session. Uh, you will hear about the role of freshwater systems in climate mitigation from different presenters and perspectives. And uh, before we go into the freshwater sector, I will give you a quick introduction to the report. Uh, this is a little bit of a repetition for those of you who attended the wash and energy sessions earlier this year. And uh, please note that you can post your questions in the chat throughout the session. Uh, use the chat function. And uh, there will be a time later where we will attend as many of your questions as possible. And please indicate what speaker the question is directed to. So this is the report, the essential drop to reach net zero, unpacking freshwater's role in climate change mitigation. And the study is a joint effort by CV, Stockholm Resilience Center, the Potsdam Institute, the UN Development Program, the German Development Agency, GIZ, and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, EMC. Next slide, please. So uh, in the report, uh, the authors uh, mapped climate mitigation measures, including actions, and response options by looking at their mitigation potential as well as their freshwater dependence and impact. Uh, we focused on measures in ecosystems and techn technological systems. And technological systems include energy as well as drinking water and sanitation services. Freshwater ecosystems include rivers, lakes, wetlands, and coastal systems and land systems include forests and forestry, croplands and rangelands. Uh, the authors have also identified freshwater related synergies and trade-offs that exist between climate mitigation and adaptation measures, as well as to enhanced system resilience, functioning ecosystems, enhanced biodiversity, uh, contributions to sustainable development. Yes, um, it is now my great pleasure to welcome Ingrid Timbo from Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, Agua, where she is policy director. And here today, she will set the scene with some opening remarks. Ingrid, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you, um, Malin. And so I, I first want to thank Siwi um, and Swedish Waterhouse for inviting me to give some framing remarks uh, for today's discussion. So I remember back to the origins of this report um, following a review of the preliminary or what they called intended nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement, which found that while water was included in most commitments, with an adaptation component, water's role in mitigation was rarely mentioned. In fact, water for mitigation was considered really a quite niche topic. Now, this was nearly five years ago, and while the importance of water for climate change has been increasingly recognized by the international climate community, um, I would argue that the topic of this webinar, in particular climate mitigation measures in freshwater systems, remains poorly understood um, and underutilized in both policy or practice. So this new report um, is a welcome and timely contribution to the evidence base, um, and I am selfishly very eager uh, to read the final version. So water for climate adaptation and resilience is well understood, I think, because most of the climate impacts we face are water related. 
adapting requires us to reckon with a changing water cycle. Where I live in the Western United States, we are simultaneously facing extremes at both ends, both a decades long drought punctuated with strong atmospheric rivers like the ones happening this week, um, producing historic flooding. On the mitigation side, the connection is not always so obvious, um, but mitigation and adaptation are two sides of the same coin. We cannot do one without the other, and as our expert speakers will demonstrate, we cannot reach our mitigation targets without the help of freshwater ecosystems. On the flip side, in this era of rapid and uneven change, um, we cannot uh, have healthy freshwater ecosystems without adaptation. We cannot go back to the ecosystems of 50 years ago. We must learn to live with change. So this theme of interconnection is one I wanna briefly highlight in, this, in these remarks. In the world of climate policy, where I spend a lot of my time, we hear a lot about the need for so-called systems approaches to addressing climate change, because after all, climate change is a systemic global crisis. Similarly, in conservation and biodiversity circles, where I used to spend a lot of my time, we talk a lot about the need for a source to see or landscape approach to ecosystem management. And so while the terminology used might be different, both of these refer to the need to do things differently, to explore and to understand interconnections between different sectors or natural systems to ensure that actions taken in one area do not have adverse or unintended consequences in others. This isn't a new idea, but it is one that is not widely practiced. Our governance, finance, and management systems remain highly fragmented, um, much like our ecosystems. So to our traditional conservation approaches, which tend to focus on a specific species, a river, or a protected area without considering the broader landscape or basin. And my colleague David will speak to this much more eloquently in a few minutes, but our national climate commitments, the ones that I mentioned at the top, thus far show similar tendencies to divide up mitigation and adaptation actions among sectors and systems. Now we know that the mitigation benefits of healthy freshwater and freshwater dependent ecosystems, which are among the most degraded natural systems in the world, cannot be achieved through traditional management approaches. Reducing eutrophication in lakes and reservoirs, preserving tropical peatlands, rethinking hydro dam siting and operations on rivers, all of those interventions require the input and ongoing engagement of multiple actors, jurisdictions, sectors, and finance institutions in most cases. So we have to work differently to achieve our goals. And I know that's the topic of, of one of the next uh, webinars as well, but I wanted to make sure that it was mentioned here um, today. So I look forward to the conversation um, that hopefully should spark some ideas about how we can simultaneously reduce emissions from our freshwater systems while improving their health for the benefit um, of people and the planet. Thank you very much. Malin, back to you. Thank you, Ingrid, for that. Um, and uh, I will now hand over to the lead author of the Freshwater Systems chapter, uh, Nareen Faisa Nisha who is a doctoral candidate at Oregon State University and co-author Ritesh Kumar, who is head of Wetlands International South Asia, to tell us more about water-wise climate mitigation in freshwater ecosystems. Thank you, Malin. Welcome, everyone. I am Noreen Faizanisha, a doctoral researcher based at Oregon State University in the United States. Um, and today we're going to talk about the climate change mitigation measures and freshwater systems. Next slide, please. So in this chapter, we take a deep dive to look how fresh water to look into how freshwater works as greenhouse gas sources and carbon sink, um, based on our review of um, almost around 500 technical reports, uh, research publications, policy papers, uh, international and uh, nationally important guidelines. We try to uh, summarize um, when freshwater systems, particularly um, wetlands, freshwater wetlands, rivers, lakes, and reservoirs act as greenhouse gas sources, act as carbon sinks, and what could be the potential mitigation uh, measures uh, uh, pertaining to uh, 
freshwater systems, um, what should be the policy considerations, how we can integrate them in our policy and practice, and what should be the key considerations as we do it. Uh, in the chapter, we also identify the knowledge and data gap uh, regarding to using, use, uh, you know, utilizing freshwater as climate solution. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, wetlands. Um, in this chapter for freshwater wetlands, we mostly consider tidal wetlands, peatlands, and inland mineral soil wetlands. Well, it is now widely acknowledged that wetlands are a very important storage of terrestrial carbon, um, despite they're the fastest declining ecosystem in the world. While healthy and um, well-functioning wetlands um, can store huge amount of carbon, degraded, depleted, um, um, drained wetlands can can highly contribute to greenhouse gas emission. The thing is, when we you know degrade or or drain our our wetlands, we not just lose the carbon that has been locked in our wetland soil for for decades and centuries. We also lose our future carbon sinks. Next slide, please. So based on our understanding, the two key mitigation measures that, that we recommend for wetlands are, first of all, to reduce conversion of wetlands for anthropogenic purposes like agriculture and urbanization and, and many other. And um, secondly, restoring or, uh, you know, wetlands such as rewetting wetlands to increase the carbon sequestration capacity. Uh, my colleague Osa here would uh, shed some light on rewetting pitlands later in this session. Next slide, please. Now coming to rivers, uh, utilizing rivers for climate change mitigation entails understanding of two aspects. First of all, um, how carbon is stored in a river system or river corridor, which means not just the active channel, but the riparian area and the, and the riverbed. Uh, and also understanding how rivers emit greenhouse gases. Now, um, when it you know comes to river system and carbon storing, the floodplain soil plays a predominant role. Um, that's mostly because of the biomass growth that they support, but also because floodplains play a very important role in, in accumulation, retention, transport of um, carbon carrying matter from the surrounding area. And um, to to enhance the carbon sequestration in, in floodplain, it's very important that it's well connected to the river stream. Disconnecting floodplains from active channel affects the carbon capture capacity of river, river corridors. And this phenomena has been studied across in different regions. Next slide, please. But we also have to understand that rivers naturally emit greenhouse gases. You know, Rivers are source of all three potent greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. And most studies after 2020 actually say that rivers are way more saturated with greenhouse gases than previously estimated. And that is mostly because of the high pollutant load that goes in our world, uh, in our rivers globally. Um, and, you know, it has, it has been seen, you know, we have very few handful of studies that have studied emission from rivers, but whatever there are evidences that suggest that emissions are found higher in river reaches with higher pollutant. We do not have enough data point. We do not have enough observations. So there clearly is a, is a knowledge and data gap regarding rivers. But if we want to utilize rivers for climate change mitigation, we have to ensure that our carbon capture in the river corridor is greater than the emission from the rivers. So here, here is an important role that rivers can play. Next slide, please. So the mitigation measures that we recommend are definitely connecting the rivers to the floodplains, limiting channel alterations um, that hamper the carbon capture capacity of the river, but also uh, pollutant control. And also we have to understand that all these uh, approaches are context specific. We have to understand what is applicable for Amazon River in South America might not be applicable for Rhine in, in Europe or, or Mekong in Southeast Asia. So we have to understand that all these are, you know, contextually tailored. And also, um, you know, the approaches should be taken in a watershed scale. Uh, my colleague uh, Gail here would discuss more about water scales, uh, watershed scale management for um, for uh, freshwater systems for climate change mitigation. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
Um, lakes and reservoirs have been previously, um, you know, acknowledged for their uh, carbon burial capacity. Uh, but most recent studies now suggest that um, our lakes and um, reservoirs are uh, net greenhouse gas sources. S particularly small lakes are large emitters because of the high amount of pollutant that goes in these lakes and, you know, the smaller surface area have and the easier war uh, air and water interaction that they have. It, it makes them very high, you know, very important and large source of greenhouse gases and also increasing temperature and high pollutant load in the in uh, in the lakes make the you know the water eutrophic which we know uh, causes harmful algal bloom which kind of reinforces the cycle of of climate change next slide please in this chapter, we include the schematic diagram that actually outlines how there's a positive feedback loop in freshwater eutrophication and greenhouse gas emissions so higher temperature and higher pollutant in the lakes create more harmful algal bloom, which emits more greenhouse gases, uh, particularly methane, which reinforces climate change, increases the temperature, and then with high pollutant load, the cycle repeats. So um, the anthropogenic activities um, like pollutant load is something that we can work on to, um, to, to utilize lakes or to, to reduce emission from lakes and reservoirs. Next slide, please. Again, landscape transformation from river to reservoir um, opens more pathways for greenhouse gas emissions than a river, you know, usually would. Um, next slide, please. So the key mitigation measures that we offer for um, lakes and reservoirs are, first of all, you know, pollutant load control, nutrient and organic matter control, um, which is part of eutrophication management. There are a lot of new technologies that are being researched and introduced for methane management in our Atlantic water sources. And also, I think it is high time that we rethink and reconsider hydropower and dam uh, dams as as clean energy sources, uh, because in a, in a lifetime of a dam or a hydropower operation, they tend to be net sources of greenhouse gases uh, than how much they offset. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, the, the mitigation measures that we were talking about, like pollutant control or um, like protecting floodplains or protecting wetlands, they actually do offer a lot of other different uh, benefits other than carbon sequestration. It, it is, you know, it ensures enhancement of ecosystem services. It provides uh, climate change adaptation and resilient benefits. It's give nature with solutions for disaster risk reduction. Like you can get flood protection from, you know, protecting wetlands or protecting floodplains. You know, it, it gives you better water quality when you do pollutant control. So there are other co-benefits that needs to be highly considered um, aside from carbon sequestration as well as we take this mitigation measures. Next slide, please. So in, in this slide, I have just put together headlines from different news portals, um, websites of different international organizations, and also some top journals that, you know, and all these are taken, you know, are published in last two to three years, which kind of shows that there is increasingly more attention given to freshwater systems although wetlands are getting increasingly more attention and rivers, lakes, and reservoirs are not getting as much. Um, but there is more attention and there is a lot to be done. Um, my colleague David here would highlight, uh, give you an insight about the latest NDCs and we'll discuss that, you know, where freshwater stays like in, 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 our, in, in, in the NDCs around the world, all the wetlands are increasingly you know, being addressed more, um, you know, there is scope to do even better and probably our rivers and uh, lakes need to be um, given more attention in NDCs and other international um, documents and nationally important documents and policies. Next slide, please. Um, I tried to summarize uh, the chapter as fast as, as I could. Uh, my, my colleague Ritesh here will give you more insight about the policy regarding uh, including fresh water in climate solution and what are the challenges. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nuri. Uh, you, after seeing the impeccable science, which talks about uh, a bi-directional role of freshwater ecosystems, sink as a source, I would reflect on the policy uh, dimensions. Next slide. Uh, 
So firstly, I think a, a good beginning point is to reflect that Ramsar Convention since 1971 has been giving an international platform to set a stage for wetlands conservation. And uh, uh, the convention is 50 years old now. Climate is definitely within its agenda and several resolutions, I could say at least 30 of them have been repeatedly calling for more national action, international cooperation around peatlands, coastal blue carbon, the role of wetlands in providing climate resiliency services, also identifying that wetlands themselves are likely to be vulnerable to climate change, and also reflecting on dimensions such as indigenous cultural values and their contribution to climate change mitigation action. So there is a whole lot of resolutions that countries themselves have adopted uh to address uh, the linkages between wetlands and climate change next slide the unfccc uh, increase in, increasingly uh, and increasingly provides space for considering wetlands and mitigation i think the 2013 report the cover of which we see in this slide was a hallmark which allows countries to bring wetlands into their assessment of Green, uh, greenhouse gas inventories, but also there are mechanisms like RED and CDM, which allow consideration of forested wetlands uh, within uh, the climate instruments triggered by the climate change discussions. Next slide. Beyond climate change, uh, like in November 2022, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, now clearly includes inland waters, at least in two targets. We wanted something more, but it is encouragingly clear that inland waters can no longer be seen as sandwiched between land and, and sea. And uh, this uh, direction to doing more effective conservation, doing more effective management, gives us a handle to address uh, mitigation dimensions as well. And beyond this, definitely next slide. You have the overarching UN decade for ecological restoration, which also creates space for building more action around uh, ecosystem uh, conservation. So where does this all of uh, uh, all of international policy lead to? Next slide. Uh, we have uh, a presentation by David, but there are increasingly positive developments. Uh, on wetlands being considered between the NDCs uh, for climate mitigation, which is a useful starting point. Next slide. But increasingly, one, uh, there are challenges as well. Uh, as Nureen rightly pointed out, wetlands are the most rapidly degrading uh, you know, ecosystems. And first and foremost is to ensure that wetland conservation and wise use is upscaled. Uh, Adopting a systems approach, not seeing water and climate as two separate uh, policy instruments, but also looking at the interactions, factoring in future climate scenarios, and Professor Gale would be speaking, alluding to, to the way wetlands themselves are going to change due to climate and also the socioeconomic change in choices is, is very critical. I invite all of you to read the report, connect with us, and over to you, Molly. Yes, thank you so much uh, for your informative and interesting presentations on the chapter, Noreen and Ritesh. Uh, now, please welcome my CV colleague, David Hibar Kolman. And David will uh, uh, share some water perspectives of countries' engagements in mitigating climate change from his study on the enhanced nationally determined contributions. David, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, next slide, we'll go straight into it and things. So the reason why we keep mentioning the nationally determined contributions is these represent a very visible commitment being made by countries in terms of addressing climate change, whether mitigation or adaptation. And as such, this gives us a good, strong feeling of where future policy is, is going. So I think this is why we continually raise this in, in this session. So CUE was commissioned to look at water and water-related contents within the enhanced NDCs. And I apologize to those who've already seen this from previous sessions, but I'm trying to be consistent across all five of these, so because we have different audiences. So I looked at 114 enhanced NDCs with a focus on non-Annex 1 countries, predominantly low and middle-income countries. 
Um, I looked at the whole raft of measures and you know around water, whether it was energy connections, whether it was wash, whether it was uh, water resource management, basin management, and other things. And overall, yes, the enhanced NDCs definitely paid much more attention to water compared to the first round of NDCs, but that focus on adaptation still remains. But what we did see from the first and the second round was a much larger focus on the role that ecosystems and biodiversity play in both adaptation and mitigation, and indeed around the resilience. Um, next slide, please. So, so some estimates say that approximately 95% of these countries would include content around ecosystems, biodiversity, and nature-based solutions. That sometimes just includes such as a thing as referring to wetlands somewhere in the document at times. I would say that approximately 42% of those contained a reasonable amount of detail around the ecosystems and biodiversity component. This would include two or more measures, some detail of what the vulnerability is and how this will help to, to drive the process forward. But approximately 22% of those 114 still didn't contain much apart from saying they're important. Uh, there were different areas where you saw um, higher levels of recognition um, from the uh, Latin American and Caribbean region and the MENA region, whilst it seemed to be slightly lower from um, Sub-Saharan Africa and sort of Eastern, Central East Europe. Um, for mitigation specifically, there was definitely a strong recognition of the role of water-related ecosystems, such as wetlands, primarily peatlands, and indeed wetland mangrove forests in terms of that coastal area. Um, and they're often referred to in the terms of being a nature-based solution for the mitigation of emissions. Next slide. Some other aspects around um, freshwater ecosystems. So overall, 50% of those NDCs contained measures and some detail around wetlands, which is at least a doubling compared to the first round. Um, marine ecosystem references, especially in that coastal area, were found in about two thirds of those countries that actually have coastal areas. And of the countries that had mangroves in the world, about 60% of them. So that's definitely an improved. Mangroves were hardly mentioned at all in the first round. So you're seeing this shift occurring at their global policy areas. Now, 10 countries mentioned freshwater ecosystems, about 9%, which would be inclusive of rivers and lakes. But despite some of the evidence that's starting to emerge, such as that out outlined by Noreen, rivers and lakes are not really there. You might get um, a, a predominant feature like Lake Chad being mentioned, but it was more of a sort of a, from a regional context than anything to do with actually whether it was adaptation or mitigation. Um, Ecosystem-based adaptation as a tool or mechanism was included in about a third of NDC. So we're seeing changes, um, but those freshwater ecosystems beyond wetlands, lagoons, mangroves, and riparian zones are hardly there. And I think this is one of those areas which does need to change. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so what were the kinds of measures? Well, you know, you had a lot of these that were what I would call general intent, you know, such as saying, look, the private sector will be engaged in the protection of flooded forests and reforestation activities, etc. There wasn't necessarily a great deal of detail around there. It's very unclear as to how this will be achieved. Um, and it you may not expect it to be in a nationally determined cont contribution, but you would expect some sort of detail about where you want to go with this. There were also the types of measures which were focused on the policy intent. You know, some countries actually actively say they wish to protect all remaining wetlands. There wasn't much detail about costing for this or necessary timeframes, but they were there. And then there were also those ones where they would include, you know, we're going to do this future activity, such as an action plan for the sustainable management of mangrove ecosystems. Next slide. Um, so this is what we get. We get a lot of measures. There's definitely more detail, but there's a lack of direction going through. There were occasional um, countries, and I do have a list here, of these countries did a lot of a better job in connecting um, freshwater ecosystems to policy direction uh, in, in their countries. Uh, Nigeria connected activities around uh, nature-based solutions or ecosystems with the reason uh, with other sectors. Uh, Bebodos looked to connect groundwater aquifers and coastal coral reefs, but these were still more rare in, in the case of, of 
compared to other places. Uh, next slide. Uh, I realize I'm running out of time. I've talked too much. So we'll go to this slide and everything. So as my colleagues also alluded to, look, many of those biodiversity measures still remain quite general. There are definite, you know, my colleague did refer to ones in Bolivia, Costa Rica, where there was a little bit more of a target, but in general, most remain quite general or standalone. They're sort of sitting in space. Uh, some targets were included, including for mitigation around wetlands, but they don't really necessarily have a great deal of baseline data to assess their effectiveness and be able to compare them with other measures. And overall, there are a few measures that situate ecosystem biodiversity within specific landscapes or basins. Now, 60% of those NDCs did refer to watershed management, which was one of the measures that was mentioned by one of my colleagues, but it's not in regard to mitigation. And mitigation at that level at the, at the landscape and at the um, catchment level, I think is one of those, those future areas for improvement. Thank you. Oh, too long. <laughs> You're fine, David. Uh, thank you right. so much. Um, we now have uh, two case studies to build further on what Ingrid, Noreen, Ritesh, and David have shared. Uh, first, Åsa Casimir, biologist and associate professor in physical geography at Gothenburg University in Sweden. And uh, Åsa will present on the importance of rewitting uh, peatlands for greenhouse gas mitigation. Welcome, Åsa. Thanks. Yes, thanks for inviting me to talk about rewetting peatlands for greenhouse gas mitigation. And I have to start with the importance of peatlands, which globally store twice as much carbon as the world's forests. So after the last glaciation period, this peat has accumulated due to anoxic conditions in wet soils, where plant litter or remnants compose very slowly. And this accumulated peat is imperative to protect. So next. So uh, instead, uh, many peatlands have been drained, mainly due to expansion of agricultural land and draining continues. This is exploitation, not protection. And the drain peat decompose much faster emitting both carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. The peat disappears and the carbon accumulates in the atmosphere. Numbers from Wetlands International tells the size about 2 billion tons carbon dioxide annually, half in the boreal temperate climate and half in the tropics. And drained peat soils are hotspots for greenhouse gas emissions. Next. So the oxygenated soil volume is crucial for greenhouse gas emission size, shown clearly in the Nature paper by Evans et al. The water table, that's the depth where the soil is water saturated and thus anoxic. A low water table means a large volume with high peat decomposition and high carbon dioxide emission. I could also add nitrous oxide, which which also increase with drainage. And the green line shows the carbon dioxide emission linearly connected to water table, which implies for every decimeter higher water table, a reduction of three tons carbon dioxide per hectare a year. However, a water table approaching the soil surface is a risk for increased methane emissions, the brown line. And together with the sea, sink. This very wet soil gets almost net zero emissions, black line. Next, please. So to achieve the sustainability development goals, Paris Agreement, Global Biodiversity Framework, and the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, it is critical to protect all wet peatlands and restore at least 50% of the drained and exploited peatlands. Sweden, as a case study, is a wet and cool country 
with many wetlands, about 8 million hectares, of which at least 80% are negatively affected by roads, etc. Some are more exploited and drained for agriculture and forestry, at least 1 million hectares. The Swedish Climate Convention reporting tells these soils have a yearly emission of in total 11 million tons carbon dioxide equivalents. This is in parity with car emissions in Sweden. In a few years time, these emissions must be mitigated. So what is the action? Next, please. During the last decade, 2010 to 2020, rewetting were made on about 5,000 hectares in total. And this is five per mil of the drained area. And the Swedish govern government then introduced the wetland investment, allocating 775 million Swedish kroners over, over three years, about 70 million euros. The result in 2021 was a mitigation of 7,000 tons greenhouse gases. This, in addition to previous rewetting, gives six per mil of drained area rewetted. Part of these funds went to the Swedish Forest Agency to block forest ditches. The result was 36 hectares blocked until 2022, last year. But the agency aims to rewet 1,000 hectares this year. If met, seven per mil of the drained peat soils will eventually be rewetted in the end of this year. Uh, in Sweden, the new government proudly announced last autumn a continuation of the wetland investment with 200 million Swedish kroners annually, 18 million euros. I would say too little, too late to cite the new book, Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity. Next, please. So re-wetting drain peat soils are a low hanging fruit for greenhouse gas mitigation. And as you remember, the deep drain soils have the largest emissions, the agricultural soils. In Sweden, with a wet climate, 5% of the agricultural land have organic soils, which emits 40% of the agricultural emissions. Of these, 75% are carbon dioxide, 20% nitrous oxide, and about 5% methane. The EU Common Agricultural Policy, a shortened cap, aims for production thus a continued peat degradation. In the new cap, however, member states are obliged to show higher green ambition, uh, very weak though, uh, no plan to rewet Swedish drained organic soils at all. And Denmark does better with restricted nitrogen input and plowing that's not enough, but uh, they plan to rewet half the area until 2030. And I urge all countries to plan for rewetting. Next. And I thank you all for listening. And I end with photos from Skogarid Research Catchment in West Sweden, where a part was rewetted last year in autumn, uh, August, you can see. Thank you. Thank you, Åsa, uh, so much for this and for the nice illustrating pictures in the end. Uh, our next case study comes from uh, Gail Chimura, a professor in the Geography Department of McGill University, Montreal, and she will explain why watershed management is critical for climate mitigation. Gail. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the webinar webinar organizers and you, the audience, for your interest. Now, my role in this chapter was to consider coastal, that is tidal wetlands that can be, in, and they can be impacted by activities that occur considerably upstream in watersheds. 
Now, as freshwater wetlands are also affected by these activities, I thought that watershed management would be in at least partially a unifying topic for our salty and fresh systems. And the impacts that I'm gonna talk about are excess nutrients and sediment deprivation from the various land uses you see in this little cartoon. Next slide, please. So first, let me explain why these phenomena have impacts and why we should care. Well, the soils of salt marshes, like the one you see on the left, and mangrove swamps, the one you see on the right, and mangroves, of course, in tropics and subtropic regions. These soils store more carbon, that is carbon and organic matter that originally came from the atmosphere as CO2, at a faster rate than any terrestrial or wetland soil. And they have, and in an undisturbed state, have negligible emissions of the potent greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. Now, these systems exist at sea level. Sea level has been rising for thousands of years and is going to continue to rise at even faster rates. So how have they have these systems also maintained for thousands of years? They're thousands of years old. One is by adding sediments to the soil surface, sediments that come in from waterways to tidal flooding, and even more importantly is root growth. And you see that center photo, the very dense root growth. We have lots more organic matter below ground than above ground in most cases. And so these two mechanisms are important to maintain these carbon sinks. Next slide, please. So what can affect that? The resilience of these, well, lack of sediment. Now, cities with all the impermeable surfaces don't provide much sediment. And dam, we know, hold back the water, but they also hold back sediments. And so this, in both of these situations, we're reducing the sediment load to waterways and eventually to coastal waters. And with our need for low carbon energy, there's an incentive for more dam construction. Next slide, please. So when I looked into this, I saw that small dams, those, and that's in the category of less than 50 megawatts, have less impact on sediment retention than large dams. And it's not just because they retain less, but for them to continue to operate, they have to flush the sediments out. So it may not be a continuous sediment supply, but at least sediment would get down to the coastline. There are other impacts, cumulative impacts, but that's outside the scope. Uh, next slide, please. Even more important in the watersheds is are the agricultural lands and also urban lands. Both of them have runoff that contains nitrogen and phosphorus, but tidal wetlands are nitrogen limited. And experiments, like you see results of and the photos on the right, in which nitrogen was added to tidal floodwaters to creeks, and those are the ones at the bottom, and compared to creeks that did not have nitrogen added had a big difference. If you look at the bottom two photos on the right, you see it's all broken up because the purpose of roots is to take up nutrients. And if the system is provided with plenty of nutrients, there's less need for root growth. So that both affects that their contribute to contribution to volume, but also to the marsh stability. There's, there's reduced soil stability. Next slide, please. But yet, yeah, wait, there's more, as we would say in old fashioned commercials. Excess nitrogen can result in increased nitrous oxide emissions. Now, depending upon the study, nitrous oxide has somewhere around 268 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide, 268 times. So it's very important to control. And if systems get too much nitrogen, these wetlands get too much nitrogen, the plants are getting sufficient nitrogen for growth so that there is a surplus available for microbes to transform the nitrate, nitrate that comes into the system into nitrous oxide. And 
the the graph on the right bottom right shows uh, experiment that we did by adding fertilizer, but I think the one on the left is more interesting. And notice the vertical axis is micrograms nitrous oxide per square meter per hour. We actually sampled the gases in chambers in a salt marsh that had absolutely no agriculture in its watershed in a national park. And that's the one in blue. Notice it goes below zero. That marsh was a sink for nitrous oxide, not just storing carbon, but taking up nitrous oxide. But if you look to the left of that in the sort of the brownish colors, that's the nitrous oxide coming from four different watersheds, both with intensive agriculture. Next slide, please. So how can we mitigate this? Well, lots of cities are building things called bioswales. And you see flooded New York streets on the left and you see New York street on the right, but with a bioswale and you can see the water running into it. So it's a great way to manage flooding, but because the water's channeled into the soil, the soil helps to reduce the nutrient and pollutant runoff to waterways. And of course we've got some green space and carbon dioxide uptake. So here is a win-win-win situation. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to add even more wins to that statement. One of my favorite projects is the STRIP project started by University of Iowa in the Midwest US. And what they do is they plant strips of prairie or grassland in amongst, in between croplands, crop fields, or around them. And their studies have shown that they can reduce the runoff of phosphorus by as much as 90% and nitrogen by as much as 85%. But I, I know in North America, and I guess around the world, native grassland, native prairies, an endangered ecosystem. So we're restoring an endangered ecosystem and a kind of ecosystem that stores a lot more carbon in its soil than crop plants and also has less greenhouse gas emissions. Now, it's a challenge for farmers because they're losing some of their crop production, but they should be able to get carbon credits for the carbon stored in the prairie strips and and once we link as we have done on prince edward island nitrous oxide emissions from watersheds we could get allow farmers to gain carbon credits for reducing the nitrogen loading to the coastal waters um, as long as we have great, good boundaries on the project. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can take down the presentation for a bit now. Uh, thank you so much, Gail. Um, and now we will welcome all speakers back and open the floor uh, for questions from the audience. And we do have one question from Alejandro Rossi. Uh, who says that it's interesting to see LAC and MENA with high percentages of NDCs referring to ecosystem protection throughout nature-based solutions. But how about efficiency of such measures? Maybe you would like to, David, comment on exist existing tools to assess the quality of uh, NBS that are being considered within uh, NDCs. So I'll be pretty quick. <clears throat> so Nature-based solutions really only emerged as a concept in the international policy framework in the last couple of years. And when you look at these national documents, there about 50% of them actually include references to nature-based solutions, even though you know some of the activities and principles have been around for a while. And they're broken into three sort of parts. You know, some of them are mitigation, some of them are adaptation, and some of them are a mix of adaptation and mitigation. But a lot of the time they talk about the need to improve or to increase, or they might give you some idea that this is the potential for nature-based solutions to provide something in this space, whether it's for resilience purposes or for mitigation purposes. But they don't really go into a great deal into how this will be implemented. There is some expectation that this might be included within an NDC implementation cap plan. But there isn't a great deal of um, real thinking about the efficacy of these at this stage. It's, it's, it's one of these things that I made a comment in the chat just before there. It takes time for some of the sort of really interesting research to actually make it into the top levels of government so that the 
they decide they're going to include it in their nature in, in their national documentation and so this nature-based solutions is one that's made it there but it's still yet to be fully worked through so yes it's there possibly not as effective as it could be thanks david um we also have a question to osa um from Ellen, is it realistic to restore 50 percent of all peat soils um surroundings have adopted to the dry surroundings and to re-wet could damage a lot um what's that please oh is it realistic to emit these large emissions to change the climate it, it's the question i would say uh mm. we have damaged ecosystem by dr dry conditions uh, also. So rewetting would maybe restore uh, uh, the, the ecosystem function instead, I would say. So of course there will there would be a change. And you could not produce potatoes and the carrots on the organic soils if you did not uh, drain them deeply. Uh, there's also a change you need to focus and don't you do you cannot have the same production as today of course thank you also um we do have another question to you also if you would like to um pick this right away um let me see um from Alejandro again uh says I would like for you to elaborate a bit more on the potential strategies for trade-off between reduction of 25 percent agriculture area area on the one hand and possible options to compensate somehow productivity of either non-rewetted areas or securing some of the uses of wetlands for sustainable organic production long question but um are you able to comment on that Osa? if i understood the question it was very long yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes of course uh, we have some production on this on this five percent of land and this must be compensated somehow maybe um of course we need the food production um but uh, maybe we can also change the diet to produce less uh, feed and and uh, livestock and then we don't need this amount of land um, and um, we could produce more effectively maybe somewhere um, also uh, that's that's my answer if it's was the question <laughs> thank you also um, we'll move on to another question directed to Gail Chimura. Um, we understand the nutrient levels in urban freshwater systems to be quite high. The bioswale example in New York City is a good example, but have you seen any studies on such small scale systems used in aggregate to reduce nutrients and corresponding greenhouse gas emissions? I haven't found any yet. I've done gone dived into some rabbit holes in the last few days trying to find records of these things and there are thousands of bioswales that have been uh created in new york city alone and i think they're fairly recent but and i see stuff on the city website about how they're doing a good job but i haven't found actually a scientific paper per se doesn't mean there's not one out there or maybe one under review but that would be, it would actually be, I guess you, all that runoff is directed to probably a single couple pipes. In many of the cases going out to Jamaica Bay where there's degraded salt marsh. So you could, someone could probably monitor that, but I don't think they've been around long enough uh, to have very many studies. Very good question though. I'll look for it. Thank you. Uh, we do have one other question to also in the chat, but I'd like to see if any of you uh, speakers have uh, questions uh, for each other, um, for example, to Ritesh and Nareen and Ingrid. Please go ahead and, and ask. Uh, 
So I, I've, I've got a question for Noreen because I, I, I must admit there was a paper I read last year, which is the first time I came across this, the river's role and, and, and has been a real focal area. Um, how would you think we need to communicate this better to some of the decision makers? Because obviously that's the space that I, I work in mostly. Um, how how would you think we can get this message across? Because I think it's it's when I sort of read it, there's some real potential there to be included around you know uh, watershed management, but it doesn't you know mitigation isn't really done at a at a watershed level. How would you sort of think this could be best achieved or best communicated to those decision makers? Thank you, putting aside your science. You know, it's very much of a communication question for a budding scientist, but <laughs> I think I think I think one way is um, I think one effective way is to highlight the co-benefits because you know, kind of also coupling it with the nature-based solution. I think um, if you know about the Room for the River project in in the Netherlands, you know, which was to extend the floodplain so that you give it gives you flood protection, which is a nature-based solution from flood protection. And, you know, I think the floodplain protection is the key thing to utilize, you know, rivers. And I think we have to kind of, you know, I think carbon sequestration or um, using rivers for mitigation or any freshwater systems or ecosystems is yet to be priority of most policymakers or countries or communities. I feel like, you know, they also look at the other roles that they play in their life and rivers definitely are very important. So I think um, that is very important. Secondly, is to communicate, like, you know, reducing pollutant load or nutrient load. I think it should be communicated in terms of water quality management, biodiversity protection, so I think kind of uh, packaging these together, that it's not just the carbon sequestration benefit that we get, it is also because of the nature of solutions it provides and the water quality benefits it provides, biodiversity protection it provides, human health benefit it provides. I think, you know, it it should be it should be communicated, you know, in 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 a combined way and not just standalone. I think that's that's gonna be effective. And 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 there are evidences that that's how it works so in in my point of view that's how i think it can be effectively communicated thank you would you put it as one of the higher priorities in that combination because of course those other factors that you've talked about have been communicated for a long time and yet rivers are still not necessarily a high priority do you think there's potential for there to help this to be the the lead of the boat say you know to, to sort of get increase its priority I would. I would. For um, climate change adaptation benefits, the resilience benefits, um, the enhanced ecosystem services that we, we get from it. I know the reason nature with solution, you know, is so highlighted now and the countries are more increasingly understanding why it's so important, um, especially under a changing climate. Um, I think it it does require to be um, a high priority, especially with increased flood. If you look at the last couple of years, you know, the flood situation around the world, like Pakistan having its worst flood in history. Uh, I think it is, it is, it, it does um, have a, uh, you know, have a potential to be high priority. So David, if I may add, I think the headline is do more conservation and do it in a nature aligned way. I think all science points have to one clear message. We aren't doing conservation enough. Don't take it in silos. I think the issue is not take peatlands, rivers, wetlands, lakes as separate. You need to do all of it, all of it in a connected sense. If rivers flow, wetlands store water, the slow water is where all the fantastic things happen, but the slow waters won't function without these connecting waters. So, and and to all of this, we, we should not look at carbon in patches, so carbon in, you know, mangroves here and carbon in peat here and carbon in highlands there. It's all connected because if the river doesn't connect the highlands with the lowlands, you won't get carbon neither in the mangroves, neither in the in the high Himalayas or wherever. So I think the story is connected. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same conservation message, but a carbon blinded approach would be something very, something that I would shift this dialogue away from. 
yes carbon is important but let's not forget that these living systems provide a spectrum of ecosystem services and and to replace all of these we will go into a carbon intensive pathway to replace a living marsh you do more engineering structure get more carbon into the system and that's what i would say has to be avoided at all cost yeah Thank fantastically you. said ritesh it is a systems approach <laughs> at the end of the day mm. Uh, thank you both, uh, David and Ritesh and Nareen, for that final question. And uh, we will now uh, wrap up the session. Uh, thank you so much uh, to today's speakers for presenting, uh, and also to my colleague Emma Jidlund uh, at CV for helping behind the scenes today. Uh, and also to all you participants and uh, with the questions you asked. And we do hope to see you again uh, next time when we will focus on climate mitigation in land ecosystems on March 30th. And uh, you can find more info about that on CV's website, or you can contact my colleague Malin uh, Lundberg Ingemarsson on her email address. Uh, thank and yes, one question. Will the recording be available after the webinar? Yes, it will on our website and YouTube. Thank you.